Good afternoon. Welcome to Panel 4, Municipal Green Urbanism and Sustainability Initiatives. This panel is going to be slightly different from the others you've heard today, as we're going to have the opportunity to share with you projects that make us proud and that have a positive effect on our local cities and on the region. So this is, once more, an example of cities being leaders in the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence affairs. After I discuss some of our projects here in Niagara Falls, I will ask Jill Jedlica, Executive Director of the Buffalo Niagara Riverkeeper, of which I was, we call it Vice President or Vice Chair? Whatever you want to call Vice, it. whatever it was, <laughs> until, until I won the election as Mayor of Niagara Falls in the fall of 2007, and I had to resign my position with that organization. And she'll talk to you more about some uh, projects that uh, Riverkeeper is undertaking in our, our region. Uh, we thought it would be useful to do a little presentation where we explain to you what it is that you're looking at if you're walking around here in downtown uh, Niagara Falls. Uh, okay, I'm pressing the wrong button. Okay, we've got that now. This is an artist's uh, aerial view of uh, downtown Niagara Falls as built out under our comprehensive plan. We like to think of this as being a sort of mirror image of Lower Manhattan, right? In Lower Manhattan, uh, you have an Olmsted Park in the center surrounded by a vibrant city around the edges. Here, we're trying to create a vibrant cent center in the middle of the peninsula that is the city of Niagara Falls and surround it with a beautiful green park. Why are we interested to do that? Well, as you heard from uh, Mark earlier today, our state park uh, draws over 8 million visitors of the 13.5 million visitors that uh, visit parks in the western part of our state, and we want them to have a positive experience here because, among other things, we think that that sends them home convinced of the importance of protecting our Great Lakes resources. Luckily, we have a regional plan in which we participated in formulating that plan uh, that emphasizes smart growth principles, uh, the creation of renewable uh, energy, and that focuses on tourism. And uh, you know, the idea that we're now developing tourism as one of our major key industries that we count on it for investment and job production, I think gives us some leverage over how that uh, process moves forward that we didn't have uh, before. But we have some major challenges. <clears throat> the picture on the upper left is a 1945 view of the street right outside where you're sitting now. That's Old Fall Street. On the left are two vaudeville uh, theaters. All right? Wouldn't you like to have that main street today as the object of an ur urban revitalization program? Unfortunately, the plan for downtown Niagara Falls, you see a model of that on the right-hand side. And as Mark Thomas said, the view of the people who did uh, the urban renewal here in Niagara Falls was that you would like to drive into the city of Niagara Falls in your automobile uh, park your car and never go outside again except perhaps for a brief 15-minute visit to, to look at the falls uh, for the rest of your uh, stay. Very much an automobile-dominated uh, uh, landscape that was proposed to be uh, created uh, there. A couple of elements of the plan that were created uh, on the upper left-hand corner, if you came uh, with your Nexus Pass across the Whirlpool Bridge, you drove under the overpass for Robert Moses Parkway North. That cuts the northern part of the city off from the Niagara River Gorge, a beautiful gorge that you see there on the left. And at lower left is what you would have uh, uh, used to enter the city of Niagara Falls from the south. So if you came across the Grand Island Bridge from Buffalo or flew into the Buffalo Airport, that expressway-style flyover was what was there a year ago today. It's gone now. That's where the traffic circle was that you came through on your way into the uh, uh, city. One of the parts of the urban renewal plan that did get built was the section of Robert Moses Parkway that passed between where you're sitting now. Can everyone orient themselves? Uh, you see the, uh, the former convention center is now the Seneca Niagara Casino at the top of the photo on the right. That yellow line is where a four-lane limited access expressway ran until 1978. This is what downtown Niagara Falls looked like in 1950. You can see easy pedestrian connections between Old Fall Street and the rest of downtown and the waterfront. Here's what it looked like in the 1970s. That's Prospect Point on the right-hand side. Four-lane 
limited access expressway, roughly what, 150 yards from the lip of the falls? Can you believe we were crazy enough to build such a thing? And then look at all of the concrete that's uh, taken up with uh, flyovers in the lower center as part of the access to the northern portion of the Robert Moses Parkway. In 1978, one of my predecessors, Mayor Michael Lachlan, succeeded in getting rid of the part in the hash marks, right? Immediately uh, adjacent to, to the park, but the rest of the parkway remained. And then we rerouted traffic along the zigzag line here from the Robert Moses Parkway south entrance on Daly Boulevard, and then rejoining uh, down the street here by the Howard uh, Johnsons with the remaining northern segment. Bless you. That wasn't what we were looking for, right? We were looking to create a sustainable downtown, a sustainable downtown neighborhood, and to restore and in part create a globally significant park. So what's the grand master scheme for downtown Niagara Falls going forward? Again, it's a peninsula with the falls at the apex. We're looking to create a dense urban core, walkable, bikeable, entertaining in the way that cities are entertaining in the center, but surrounded by green space on all sides. The state park uh, that you see at the apex of the triangle, but then also new green space that is being created with the removal of the section of the upper Robert Moses Parkway on the left and the Robert Moses Parkway north on the right hand uh, side. Again, Old Fall Street, you can orient yourself. You're on Old Fall Street about halfway between those two arrows, uh, one of which points to the entrance to the Seneca Casino uh, the other to the 1885 entrance to the state park. So our hope is that we're restoring pedestrian connections on three sides of this uh, uh, triangle and making it possible for everyone who comes to downtown Niagara Falls with just a very short walk uh, to experience a very wild uh, uh, view of either the upper rapids or uh, even the gorge. There's an aerial view of Old Fall Street with the Seneca Casino in the background, the park in the foreground. Can you locate yourself on this picture? But probably by now you can, right? Uh, again, the idea, the easiest possible pedestrian access from the park into the heart of the city, trying to encourage people to move back and forth between the two. Does that mean that we don't want urban development in downtown Niagara Falls? No, it doesn't. The next project that we hope to launch uh, is a $150 million project taking 200,000 square feet of a long vacant uh, mall here in downtown Niagara Falls, a third of which has now already become the Niagara Culinary Institute, if you had the opportunity to get down there. Uh, we're looking uh, to uh, build a 15-story uh, hotel with 300 rooms on that site in the urban core, but then we're looking to transition over a, a distance of only a few hundred yards into a much more park-like atmosphere. This requires great discipline in the field of development. It requires great uh, planning, uh, but the paradigm has held here long enough now to start making this the reality uh, for downtown Niagara Falls. Uh, the Robert Moses Parkway South project, a $22 million project, uh, will be completed later this uh, summer. Uh, before that uh, project had even launched, it had stimulated the construction of four hotels, one of which is open already, three of which will cut the ribbon uh, this summer. So if anyone tells you green infrastructure doesn't encourage economic development, send them to Niagara Falls and we'll show them that they're wrong. That's why we're so excited about what we think is going to happen next with the Robert Moses Parkway North along the beautiful Niagara River Gorge. If you're staying around for a bit after the conference, you're looking for something to do, take a hike in the Niagara River Gorge. It's one of the most beautiful places anywhere in the Great Lakes. And uh, it's gonna become even more beautiful with the removal of the four lane expressway and the creation of the hiking and biking trails that you see in the artist conceptions uh, there in front of you. Seven acres of pavement being removed, creating 135 acres of fully accessible green space, and then connecting the city to the 400 acres of basically wilderness park that exists along the Niagara River, uh, along the Niagara River Gorge. The largest expansion of the park here at Niagara since the time of Frederick Law Olmsted in 1885, and you're here to be witnesses to it in the year 2016. Your timing was absolutely perfect, right? So this is a new city for the 21st century that we're trying to build a city in a park a city with a vibrant, mixed-use downtown and seamless connections to the water's edge. The very best of the natural 
and the very best of the built environment. I don't know how to turn it off. <laughs> Thank you. And now to continue our discussion about projects here in our Buffalo Niagara region, please welcome Jill Jedlica of Buffalo Niagara Riverkeep. Jill. Whoa. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mayor. Um, see what happens when you serve on the board of an environmental nonprofit organization for a while. Um, but actually, the, it's we've been very lucky to have had the great relationship with the mayor. And, and I, I can't jump into my presentation without acknowledging what tremendous leadership he has had in Western New York um, over these last series of years. He, his innovative thinking, his creative thinking with his team, um, Tom DeSantis, another key member, um, former board member of Riverkeeper, board, board uh, Riverkeeper Emeritus. Um, between the two of them, um, we have strong confidence in the direction that Niagara Falls is going in this region, um, and it's just wonderful to be able to be living it right now. Um, I also apologize that I'm part of the panel that's standing between you and happy hour, um, so hopefully we'll, we'll have a, enough of this to, to feel, make you feel inspired to make your happy hour or that much happier when we get there. Um, so Buffalo Niagara Riverkeeper is a nonprofit organization that's been around for about 25 years. And our mission is solely to work towards the protection of water quality and quantity for both present and future generations and to connect people to water. It is the basis of our work. It is why we are founded. But that, how we go about doing that, has evolved over time. Um, and it's evolved based on the needs of our community and based on the needs of the partners that we work with. Um, certainly through our work, um, if there's one message and one thing I hope that you leave with today and remember today, as the nonprofit and NGO community are not necessarily the enemies. We don't see government as the enemy. Nonprofits today in, in this day and age can be, can be marginalized or can be um, stigmatized as just having one focus and one mission. Um, but in our work and in our experience that we've had here in Western New York, and I hope to be able to share with you over these next few minutes, is how we've approached things differently here in Western New York. And by doing that, we have made tremendous change that will last for the next several generations. Um, just a little bit of the geography that we are. Um, many of you are maybe somewhat familiar about uh, being in Niagara Falls. The city of Buffalo is about 20 miles away. But our geographic range is the entire Niagara River watershed, which is 1,400 square miles. The Niagara River is a connecting channel. It's not actually a river. Um, and we do also deal with the uh, eastern basin of Lake Erie and the western basin of Lake Ontario. We are surrounded by water. Water defined our future. It will certainly uh, define our history, and it will certainly, certainly define our future. Um, just a little plug for ourselves. <laughs> Last year, we were honored as being um, the, awarded the North American River Prize. This was awarded by the International River Foundation based in Brisbane, Australia. Um, we were acknowledged for our 20 years wor uh, of work and our innovation and creativity, and we also were just announced as a semi-finalist for the Global Thies, Environment, uh, Thies International River Prize, which will be awarded in New Delhi, India in September. Um, so fingers crossed with that. So where did we start from? Um, I don't know all of your stories. I don't know your communities. Hopefully some of this will resonate um, with you. But here within our community, an example would be the Buffalo River. This was the definition and description of what the Buffalo River was in the 1960s. This is a river that was declared dead. It wasn't a river. Nothing survived here. It was functionally became a conduit for wastewater. That's what we did to our water in terms of progress and economic development and the industrial revolution that happened. I'll let you read that quote, but you should know, I think, that you don't want your river to be a boundless mosaic of color. That is not what we're striving for, and that is where we started from. So over time, through the region, both Buffalo and Niagara Falls and all the areas in between, we had a strong industrial and, um, history. We were the nation's repository for waste. We were using our water resources as waste receptacles. So here in this region, we have a legacy of contamination that we have to clean up. However, we also have a legacy of civic engagement and strong community voices that help drive change. So how do we take this legacy from this traditional Rust Belt community and reinvent and rebrand ourselves as a community? 
And it's something that you're seeing uh, that Mayor Dyster talked about Niagara Falls. It's happening in the city of Buffalo, and it's happening within the communities everywhere in between in western New York. So how does civic engagement drive change? It starts about shifting that paradigm. How do we value our waterways? Yes, they provide drinking water. Yes, they're waste receptacles. But also, there's a myriad of, of opportunities and uses and benefits of our local waterways. Everything from the aesthetics to the marketing components of it, ecotourism, obviously the ecological values. It's starting to think about your water resources different, differently. And by looking and approaching things differently is how we are able to make that progress. One of the major efforts that we are just wrapping up, and when I say we, it's the bigger we, um, Riverkeeper and our partners, which includes federal government, state government, local government, and private corporations. Together, we banded together and we called together almost $100 million, yes, $100 million from state and federal resources in order to clean up and restore the Buffalo River. And it happened over an eight-year period of time. It was a team of rivals model. It was everybody around the table, year after year after year, with a common goal in mind. And we were all committed to it, whether we had a screaming match behind closed doors or shaking hands in front of the camera. At the end of the day, we knew that we were going to restore this river and try to restore this river, and, and we have to some extent. We still have some work to do. What are some of the other approaches that Riverkeeper is using? Um, Mayor Deister said it himself, green stormwater management, green infrastructure. These were weird, scary words eight years ago. Uh, Buffalo Niagara Riverkeeper was one of the first in this region to start talking about this methodology. People looked at us like we had three heads. How, you can't do green infrastructure in a cold city that has winter 12 months of the year. Well, no, we don't have winter 12 months a year, but sometimes it feels like it. Um, it's, it's about the methodologies. It's understanding it. It's how can you apply it within your community. Um, real quickly with this, uh, an example of the Buffalo Sewer Authority, they had a long-term control plan and they were in a negotiation for their consent order with the EPA. Their initial uh, half a billion dollar plan was 100% gray infrastructure because that's what they knew and that was what was easy. Only five minutes, oh God. Okay, <laughs> so um, fast forward really quickly. Um, we created a green infrastructure solutions report. We looked holistically at the, at the region and in the sewer district. Long story short, we were able to get the sewer authority to commit to $92 million of green infrastructure. It was the largest percentage of green infrastructure in um, this region. Um, if there's two words that you're gonna remember also when you leave today, it's protecting, that's four words, living infrastructure. Just as we need to protect and design our built environment, we need to protect the living infrastructure that it already exists out there. Our wetlands, our forest tracks, our riparian areas, all of these are natural filters, flood management, water treatment, water quality. Maintaining and protecting our living infrastructure is just as important as maintaining and protecting, maintaining and protecting our roads. Um, this image right here, is an old steel uh, manufacturing facility at Riverbend. It is now the shorelines of where Solar City is going in in the city of Buffalo and part of the $12 million worth of habitat that we're restoring. <coughs> Advocacy. Sometimes that can be seen as a bad word or it can be a little scary because it comes close to the term lobbying. Um, but nothing moves and motivates your constituents and your communities than having citizens engaged in advocacy and feeling that they have a voice and they need to have a meaningful voice. And in order to have a meaningful voice, you need to understand the, you need to understand the conditions around you. So getting boots on the ground. Uh, we also work on uh, enhancing communities, parks, and open space because if people can't get to the water, they're not going to be the advocates that you need. And always, obviously, connecting people to our water. And I will pause here for a second because it's not just about getting kids on the water and kayaks for photo opportunities. It's about truly getting key decision makers out on the water. So just by a show of hands of all the leaders in the room, how many of you have ever either been on a kayak or a boat or out on the water in your community? That's only about half the crowd. I would strongly, strongly urge you, as Great Lakes leaders, you need to get out of your offices. You need to get out on the water because you will be able to see your community completely differently. It will transform you because it looks differently, it smells differently, and it's, it's just a different perspective. 
And that was part of the work that we did in order to convince these decision makers that yes, it does make sense to prioritize waterfront restoration and cleaning up this dead river. Because that $100 million effort to clean up that river has stimulated almost another $200 million in private investment that is now coming in. And the only reason that those investors are coming in, and they will tell you, the developers that we've worked with, are saying they're investing their private capital because of the promise and the commitment to a restored waterway. We have some guiding principles um, about our rust to blue uh, transformation. Healthy water will always drive economic revitalization. It's not an afterthought, it is a primary goal. Uh, public access, you have to prioritize that for your community. Design natural systems into economic and community redevelopment. Development is not a bad word, it just needs to be cited appropriately and respect the natural environment in which it exists. Um, the Greenway, the Niagara Greenway, which I don't have time to talk about, but for us, between connecting Lake Ontario to Lake Erie is a prime ecotourism attraction for this region. I got two minutes. I won't breathe. Um, and ultimately, public-private and nonprofit partnerships. So there's always a there's a there's a marketing and a story. Every place has a story, and that's what connects with people. In Buffalo and Western New York, yeah, we like beer. <laughs> a lot of people beer. <laughs> so to connect why clean water is important, you cannot have great beer without clean water. That's just one marketing campaign. We need to make sure that our community is not for sale. It, water in our area is not a commodity to be bought, bought and sold. It is something that we need to protect, to restore. We, we use it and we return it in the way it should be. Uh, we also do a lot of water policy and planning work. Again, you can read through it. I'm not going to read it to you. Um, and I wanted to leave you with this last slide, um, thinking about the world without water. This is Niagara Falls in 1965. It was dried 69. up. 69. Um, when the Army Corps of Engineers had stopped the flow of the falls uh, for you know, uh, dealing with the, the rocks and, the, and the, the so forth to clean that up. So just to, that's a compelling image if this world did not have the water that we have. Niagara Falls as a city would not be here if it wasn't for the cataracts that exist. Um, it is the most important resource that you have within your community, whether you know it or not. By, because you're here, I'm sure that you do know it. But as leaders, you need to take that message back to your community, and you need to, to repeat it loud and clear over and over again, because people will listen and they will, they will support you. And that's it, and I can breathe now. So thank you very much for your time, um, and thank you for listening. Thanks very much, Jill, but both for your presentation and for all the stuff that Riverkeeper does for our region. So now we're going to travel east to the Quebec City area to learn about a new regulatory framework to protect drinking water sources. Please help me welcome the Deputy Mayor of one of the most beautiful cities in the world, Quebec City, and a member of the Quebec Metropolitan Community Council, Michelle Maureen Doyle. Thank you. Can I get this? That's what happens when you're short. <laughs> well, first of all, bonjour, good afternoon. I know I'm keeping you from the cocktail, so I'm going to try and be as concise as possible. Ça va tu, Benoît, là, t'as l'habitude? Okay, thank you. Benoît's going to be clicking for me, because for once I am going to use my mail side. I can't do two things at once. <laughs> First of all, I really like to thank you on behalf of the Quebec Metropolitan Community, which I'll refer to as the QMC, for giving us the opportunity to uh, present an issue of great concern. In the Quebec City area, we have been tackling a major issue for almost a year now, which involves both public health and environmental uh, protection. For the last f nine months, protecting our water sources has been part and parcel of our discussions and decisions as elected officials. It is a key issue that affects not only the 28 cities and municipalities in the QMC community, but also 800,000 citizens. Just as an, a point of information, did you know that in Quebec, over 200 municipalities are currently under a boil water or drinking water avoidance advisory? Some have been under such advisories for 15 years. The quality of water, both groundwater and surface water, poses a real and immediate challenge. Quebec is surrounded by water, which seems to perpetuate the myth or give the impression that, that the, this resource is inexhaustible. However, we know that this is not the case. But it does partially explain why Quebec still ranks among the largest consumers of drinking water in the world. The time has come, though, for us to strive towards a common goal, that of consuming water more responsibly 
and protecting our water sources. In the summer of 2015, the QMC examined the condition of its drinking water sources and we basically gave it a comprehensive health check. What was the diagnosis? The region's drinking water sources are vulnerable and some critically so. And in essence, it was a wake-up call. One example is Lake saint jean that you have on your screen. The main drinking water reservoir for over 300,000 Quebec City residents, which in the past five years, despite our efforts, has aged the equivalent of 25 years on the human time scale. In concrete terms, in five years, the lake salinity has risen dramatically. This is due in large part to the widening of a nearby highway and the increased use of road salt. Furthermore, the size of the aquatic plant communities on the lake is eight times what it was just eight, five years ago. This points to a growing input of nutrients, mainly nitrogen and phosphorus, originating upstream. Since 2006, up to 17 cyanobacteria outbreaks a year have been observed in the Lac Saint-Charles. Not a pretty picture. As elected officials, we know all too well that we are responsible for providing sufficient amounts of quality drinking water to our citizens. It is also both an individual and co collective issue. Individual, since it has an impact on public health and the health of citizens we serve and represent. Collective, since if the situation continues to deteriorate, all of our citizens and our administrations will suffer the consequences. Moreover, a number of studies have shown that the more contaminated the water, the more costly it is to treat. Therefore, from an economic, environmental, or social perspective, we really do not have the luxury of continuing along the same path without changing our ways of doing things. We can't continue to use the same principles and expect a different outcome. Obviously, nobody is against virtue. Everyone agrees on the need to protect water sources. However, so far, this has been easier said than done, believe me. The geographical location of Quebec metropolitan area means that our sources of water originate well upstream of the city and the water passes through several municipalities before reaching the intake site. Barely a few years ago, these municipalities were a destination for vacations or recreation. Then, due to a sudden rise in popularity for these areas, they were developed at an outstanding rate. This has had a real and visible impact on water sources. Theirs, those of Quebec, and those of the neighboring cities. Let's take, for example, the location of the wastewater treatment plant at Lac d'Alage, a municipality that counts 624 inhabitants. It is located and was built directly on the floodplain at the head of the Lac saint charles the drinking water reservoir for our, our Quebec City residents which today makes no sense environmentally. Territorial wars have been around for ages and will continue to be part of our daily lives. However, when it comes to protecting water sources, the QMC wanted to raise the level of debate, allow all stakeholders to sit around the same table and ensure that everyone's constraints and challenges are reconciled for the common good. In recent years, we have been working with several environmental organization, research chairs, and scientists from various fields. We have acquired more and more scientific knowledge on our water courses. For instance, 42,000 samples were collected between 2009 and 2015 from eight water courses and lakes of the watershed of the Lac saint charles River intake. Based on this new information, it was apparent that we had to change our approach to urban development, wastewater management, road salt management, and responsible consumption. Don't get me wrong, it is quite legitimate for people to want to live near water in quiet and wooded areas. However, the fact is that for decades, the appeal of nature has been combined with a mad dash to bring in new tax revenue. Too often masking the negative impacts on our decisions. This is the perverse effect of funding our municipalities. Over the past 20 years or so, we have seen urban development of our entire green belt. As a result, citizens who move to these areas no only want public services as much as those in the urban areas. They also want roads, which has an impact on our environment. As you can see, 
these decisions have an impact on our, our, uh, our water sources that only emerge 10, 12, or 15 years later. So you can see there's many challenges to overcome, despite the fact that many initiatives have been implemented in our city to protect riparian strips and control erosion, erosion among other things. Already in 2010, we saw that our water sources were deteriorating. We adopted a first bylaw, and as you can see, as a result of our analysis in 2015, the situation had not improved. We realized that certain adjustments were required to our initial bylaw to give it a bit more bite, and it needed more teeth. So we redid our homework and adopted a second bylaw, which this time was much more restrictive. Trust me, it was not an easy decision, and it was not did not garner much consensus at the, at the outset. So overall, contrary to the 2010 bylaw that applied uniformly to all watersheds, the 2015 bylaw proposes five vulnerability zones that are subject to more or less stricter rules depending on the area's biophysical characteristics. Construction will be no, no longer be allowed on land with a slope exceeding 15%. In 2010, it was 25 Buildings with a septic system will now be prohibited, and only buildings connected to a sewer system will be allowed. This was not the case in 2010. Owners will also have to respect a vegetarian or plant cover ranging from 50 to 70 percent, depending on which vulnerability zone they live in. It will no longer be possible to add any buildings, whether main or secondary, within a 500 meter radius of Lac Saint Charles. In a nutshell, we have to stop stripping mountains, which play a fundamental role in preserving our water sources. This, this bylaw makes it possible to act immediately and prevent problems from getting worse. We certainly could not wait another 10 years to implement such measures or our Metropolitan Land Use Management and Development Plan and the ensuing bylaws. This announcement obviously caused much apprehension and strife with citizens as they were wondering what will happen to their land. And of course, this is an important talk when I talk about the citizens because we had to do it on a humane basis because it obviously had an impact on uh, personal wealth. A lot of young couples had invested their life savings in land, so we worked with them with strict guidelines so that we did manage to get them a, a plan. Uh, we also garnered, it was important for us to take this to the people so we um, ensured social acceptability and we garnered the support and engagement of the public. We did this through televised information sessions. Consultation sessions were held in each municipality, 28. Uh, it was quite uh, interesting evenings, I can tell you that. But as a result of educating, raising awareness and explaining to the citizens why we were doing this and what was the impact on their drinking water today and the future, Eight out of ten citizens living in the areas affected by this new bylaws were in favor of adopting stricter rules on development to ensure, like I said, not only their access to quality drinking water and potable water, but also for their children and their children. So as mentioned earlier, our bylaws calls for the respect of uh, areas' uh, biophysical characteristics and the capacity to accommodate new buildings. So this obviously has an impact on future development and the revenue of this municipalities. But it is our um, principle, and we took a stand on this, that the watershed's long-term health, which in turn will benefit everyone, far outweigh the short-term financial gain and injection of revenue. And I think that's an important fact. There is, you cannot put a price on quality drinking water. Uh, and I think uh, that was one of our main things. We had to act, we had to act now. It is not a legacy that we wanted to leave to our future generations. So obviously we had some elected officials that still believe that development is not at cause. We tend to disagree. So in conclusion, uh, what we hope to achieve with this new bylaw is to perfect our scientific knowledge on these water sources ensure municipal government stakeholders support legislation to protect water sources. Um, development in its current form on watersheds where water is drawn is now being reconsidered, not to prohibit it in, except for certain areas, but to better guide and structure it. So I think in closing, because I'm, I'm getting short on time, I want to say that it took a lot of political courage to do this. Um, it wasn't easy. The citizens are on board, and I think 
uh, where is Mayor Dickert? We did put on our big pants, our big uh, boy and girl pants. Uh, we're proud of this, and we must uh, say that we are but the temporary custodians of this precious resource, and we're proud that we're going to leave this legacy for the future generations. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Deputy Mayor. But, you know, more than ever, protecting our drinking water by all means possible is the key to the prosperity of our region. And as they say, if it was easy, someone would have done it already, right? Finally, we're coming back this direction to the shores of Lake Ontario to talk about the Inspiration Lakeview Project in Mississauga, Ontario. To do so, please welcome Councillor Jim Tovey, leader of the project and promoter of community-based planning. Councillor, it's nice to see you other than on Twitter. <laughs> Thank you. Is it uh, up or down? What do I use? Here? So what do I hit one of those? Yeah. That one? That'll move it? Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you, everyone. Um, you will probably notice I'm a little bit nervous. That's for two reasons. One is when I was nine years old, I had a really bad swimming accident and crushed my neck. It makes my hands tremor, so a lot of people naturally think I'm, I'm nervous. And then the second reason is, to be quite honest with you, I sit on a lot of boards and committees, and this is the one group of people that really intimidates me because you do the best work of anybody I've ever met in my entire life. The, this work is so important, so thank you all for that. Our, our uh, story is actually a story of a community. Um, our story isn't a story of what government did, it's a story of, of what we as a community stopped government from doing before I was elected. So I'm just going to give you the site context within the Golden Horseshoe. So Lakeview, which is in Mississauga right there, is the blue dot. So that's in the Golden Horseshoe. And if you, put a, if you actually put a, a, a compass in that, it's right smack in the middle of the Golden Horseshoe, which is interesting. Uh, this is the context within the GTA, and it's uh, 6.2 million people. So what we're planning on doing is creating the world's most environmentally sustainable community on a 325-acre site that we have down there, former Brownfield. And uh, the first piece of it, which is fully funded, is a 64-acre conservation, uh, conservation area. This is the site as it currently exists, um, as it is today. I always like to show people, and I love to show people this because this is exactly the same site in uh, 1942, but it's uh, substantially what the site looked like in 1891 when the federal government purchased it and instituted all those firing ranges that you can see. It had a beautiful sandy beach there where it says Long Branch and lots of wetlands, lots of creeks, and of course that's what humanity does to our natural environment. In the uh, GTA we've eliminated 93 percent of our wetlands, uh, which is not a good thing, because we're taking the lungs out of the Great Lakes. Um, this is uh, the Women's Home Garden, 1914, practicing, just in case anybody comes over. And uh, this is them practicing on the site. So it has a great, uh, a great history and a, and a great heritage uh, that the community is extremely proud of, but it's also a history and a heritage of pollution at the same time. Uh, this is Canada's first airport. That's uh, J.D. McCurdy, who was the first man to fly an airplane in Canada in 1909. He flew the Silver Dart. And Glenn Curtis was up in Canada. He was an American, but he was up here because the Wright brothers kept suing him for his, for his patents. So he came up to Canada, and this was the very first airport in Canada. And eight of the top 15 aces from World War I were trained on the site. Uh, then in uh, 1940 to 1946, 16,000 Canadian women worked on the site uh, as tool and die makers, welders, machinists. Uh, it was really the entrenchment of the feminist movement in, uh, in, in our country. Uh, 1939, a woman could make 25 cents. They were offering 50 cents for, uh, for people to be, uh, to be tradespeople. And there's some uh, funny stories there that I don't have time for just yet, because I know a lot of these girls. They're in their 90s, and they're still pretty feisty. And then this is the Lakeview Coal Generating Station. Um, which at the time was the largest coal generating station in North America, uh, 2,250 megawatts, and uh, I, it was still in operation when I moved into Lakeview. And because Lakeview was a community, much like a lot of communities, where um, you always, and this is what we do as a society, is we dump dirty things in dirty neighborhoods generation after generation, and we just keep doing it because they don't complain much. So that's what happened in Lakeview until uh, myself and my little group of uh, rebels got a hold of it, shall we say. So we managed to get, and uh, this is when I got involved, was in about 1990, I started doing research on the toxic substances coming out of coal generating stations and realized that it had negatively impacted the health of three generations of children growing up in our neighborhood. 
So we petitioned, we worked really hard, we got very organized. We got it closed down in 2005, and then uh, the city of Mississauga decided to partner with the province of Ontario and build a 1,000 megawatt gas plant to replace it and double the size of the sewage plant. And I thought that was a really bad use of land because it's uh, 15 minutes from Toronto International Airport and 15 minutes from Yonge Street in Toronto, and it's five and a half kilometers of waterfront and three, well, currently 250 acres, but when we finish filling in the lake, it'll be 325 acres. So we uh, started organizing as a community and said, we asked one question. If we can reverse 120 years of military, industrial, and utility pollution and create a model of sustainability for the world, what's it look like? So we started that in 2006. Long story short, I partnered with the University of Toronto with one of my neighbors, that's him in the middle. And uh, after three years, we became the very first uh, residence association in North America to create our own master plan, do a complete cost analysis of it, and have it adopted by all levels of government. It was called the uh, the uh, Lakeview Legacy Project. We won two national awards for urban planning as a citizens group, so it was like kind of fun. It was really fun. Then I uh, chaired a committee for the mayor on waterfront development and environmental sustainability, and then a bunch of people said, we need to get you elected, so I thought that was crazy, and my wife said, yeah, we need to get you elected, so I cut off my ponytail and pulled a David Bowie and reinvented myself and got elected by 129 votes. <laughs> well, you know, David Bowie can do it, anyone can do it. So then we created, a, we, we actually created a, a master plan, a new, a new master plan. We sort of looked at all the work we had done in the legacy project, and really this master plan really sits on the shoulders of the legacy project. It's really not much different. Uh, those are all the numbers, 8,000 units, 15 to 20,000 people, seven, 9,000 jobs, uh, 12 hectares of uh, public parkland, four hectares institutional, and then of course uh, the cultural incubator so we can have clubs and have lots of great music and boardwalks and things down on the waterfront. And the other thing we really wanted, and uh, so 85% of this is, uh, is three to eight stories, 15% of it is eight to 15 stories. Uh, we used uh, places like Malmo uh, Sto uh, in Stockholm, Copenhagen, Paris, La uh, Hammerby, Royal Seaport, uh, some of the world's most environmentally sustainable communities uh, as a model. So I have to keep going because I don't want to run out of time because my friends tell me I could do this all the time. So yeah, is that five minutes? Wow, okay, I'm good. <laughs> this is great. So, um, so when we started, wish I could go back one slide actually, but too late, we can talk about it later. So what we did, uh, the first piece of it that we noticed was we have two creeks here. One of them's in a, in a ditch and the other one's uh, in a pipe underneath the sewage plant, which the sewage plant actually, which we, we had a guy come over from Hammerby in, in Sweden uh, to help us with the master plan because they know how to do things over there. And the first thing he did was he said, wow, you got a sewage plant, are you ever lucky? <laughs> and I went, what do you mean lucky? And then we started getting, uh, getting really educated on district energy and the sewage plant is actually gonna create the heating, cooling, and the hot water for this entire new community. So that's, uh, he, he was right, it was a big, it's a great benefit. So when we started the Lakeview Waterfront Connection, because we, we do do a lot of community consultations and a lot of community work, because really that's, that's where I come from, um, we, we took uh, all of the, uh, everything in the Lakeview Waterfront Connection uh, that we'd done, uh, as far as the uh, Inspiration Lakeview, we took all, all of that into consideration. We looked at everything the province of Ontario had written. We looked at a lot of stuff that the Great, Great Lakes uh, water quality agreements, and we worked all of that into it. We set up a, a really fantastic team. We set up a really aggressive timeline to get the Lakeview Waterfront Connection into the ground, and we are now at implementation phase. We started building it three weeks ago, actually. Um, and uh, it's really fun. It's really a lot of fun. Uh, we put together a coordinated uh, management approach, so uh, you can just read all that. But all the advisory committees on the outside really were what drove the uh, what drove it. Uh, we had I'm on the board of the Toronto Region and the Credit Valley Conservation Authority because the TRCA has the best lake fill experts in Canada, and the Credit Valley Conservation Authority has the best marine biologists and habitat restoration people. So I thought if I can get on both boards and I can figure out what we can do with the two million cubic meters of dirt that the region of Peel is paying to, to drive up to Barrie in a dump truck and get them to give me the, t the $10 for the cubic meter and the cubic meter of dirt, how, how much would that contribute to the project and, and what could we actually create by it? So we spent four and a half years on a, an environmental assessment. We set out our goals, 
as you would expect, naturalization, access compatibility, coordination, and of course, fiscal viability, because you cannot have sustainability without it being financially sustainable. It doesn't work. Uh, we have two creeks, and you can see the blue lines where the creeks are. One's a ditch, the other one's underneath our lovely sewage plant. Uh, no fish species at all. We also had a, uh, we had a historic uh, industry across the waterfront in Mississauga called stone hooking, uh, where you, um, where they actually, just what it sounds like, they hook stones off the bottom of the lake, they put them on barges, they took them over to Hog, uh, Hogtown, which was Toronto, and they sold them by the ton, and they built all the houses in Forest Hill and Rosedale, and, uh, but consequently, the bottom of the lake there looks like a billiard table, it's, there's no habitat. So we're restoring uh, all kinds of underground spawning beds and shoals and all kinds of neat things like that. We're gonna connect nine and a half kilometers waterfront. This is a great image of a, uh, satellite of the Mississippi Flyway, that's 400,000 birds, and they're all landing right, to, right where we're going to be building this wetland, and by the time they get there, they're going to be awfully hungry. And of course, compatibility, we want to say, well, you know, how can we uh, reuse this, uh, this fill to, to make this project financially viable? Um, so I'm going to flip through this because I think I'm running out of time. Yes, she's giving me the two minutes. <laughs> so this is part of the consultation we did. Uh, we consulted with everybody for literally four and a half years while we were doing the EA. Uh, we also met with a lot of government officials. That's uh, Charles Souza, our finance minister in Ontario, and a few other people. Um, we worked it into five different preferred alternatives. I'm actually getting to the plan. Don't worry about it. Um, this is the, in blob form. Um, this is a, a swamp bog section. That's about a mile and a half, by the way, the length of that. And uh, then we have a forested area that we're going to plant. This is sort of what the edge treatment will be like. Uh, then we have meadows. We're putting in all different uh, types, uh, types of uh, planting material that's going to attract migra migrating birds so they can feed on it. And this is how we're going to handle some of the revetment. It goes from revetment to Cobble Beach to Sand Beach. And uh, these are the islands that will protect it from the 100-mile surge that comes across Lake Ontario. And this is a detailed plan of it uh, with the topographical lines. This is sort of what some of the features will look like. This is it in more detail. Each one of those topo lines is uh, one meter in, in elevation. And you can see we have two wetlands, a swamp bog, a forest, and then, of course, another wetland and cross-section drawings. I, you, you've probably guessed by now that my background's construction, right? <laughs> it is. And uh, the seating nodes, uh, it's gonna have an amphitheater in it that where we'll be able to teach people about the natural environment. This is our new Searsons Creek. This is a view of the Rock Over Islands, and that's looking towards Toronto. And that's it. And these are the uh, lots of benefits, of course. We're, we're, we're targeting sturgeon and brown trout, mostly. And these are more of, the, more of the benefits. And my favorite slide. And this is really interesting, because we've been talking about wetlands. I'm sorry, I'm gonna t I have to take another minute. Because we've been talking about wetlands, and, and I absolutely agree. The urban people need to do, do more about wetlands. We've eliminated 93% of our wetlands in the GTA. But here, this is shocking. We have 742.9 hectares of existing habitat across our waterfront and up and down the Credit River. By us putting this in, oh, and if you look at the swamp section of it, it's swamp and wetlands, it's only 8% of the total is swamp and wetlands. And what we're gonna be doing just in this one project, we're gonna be increasing it by 31, point, 31 and a quarter percent. And we're only, we're only doing 64 acres. That's, that's, that tells you how much work we need to do on urban wetlands, uh, because uh, the Credit River, where, uh, which is also in my ward, is the third largest contributor of phosphorus to uh, Lake Ontario, so please don't blame the farmers. So that's that, and then the numbers. The fill is actually gonna contribute uh, about $25 million to the project, which leaves, the, leaves us to pay for 31 million, and we're gonna work that off our water and wastewater charge, and it's uh, 0.6, five of a 1% additional on the water charge over 10 years and it pays for the whole project. So I think it's well worth it. Thank you. Thanks, Jim, very much. As I said, i following Jim on Facebook, or on Twitter, rather, and I've been watching the development of this pro uh, project just up the Golden Horseshoe for some time. 
and it's very, very exciting for all your neighbors on this side of the, the, the river uh, as well. Uh, if one of the other great things about Mississauga, if you're interested in architectural design, of course you know that the movie uh, Niagara, starring Marilyn Monroe, was filmed here in Niagara Falls. There's a Maryland connection in Mississauga. Uh, the most aesthetically pleasing high-rise building I think that I've seen you know, in yes. a long time is located in Mississauga. They call it the Maryland. See if you can figure out why. If you, if you Twitter it or Facebook it or something, you'll figure out pretty quickly, right? So, uh, and uh, on that note, if you've been following the Twitter page of uh, one of our project or of our uh, conference sponsors, the Made of the Mist Corporation, you'll find out that while we were on Goat Island last night, Kate Hudson was wandering around there someplace taking oh, wow. selfies of herself and wow. posting them, and nobody noticed that she was there, right? Mm. You might see yourself in the background of some of those pictures if you go check them out online. So uh, we have time here for a few questions. Uh, please identify yourself, who you represent, uh, state your question uh, briefly so we can get to as many people as possible in. And uh, uh, with that, who's got a question? Great. Cocktail time. You know, Dave, I think some of these guys had enough cocktails last night that they could use a couple questions just to delay the inevitable here. Oh. Mr. Oh, Ulrich? Tom's got one, too. But, uh, Jill, uh, first of all, congratulations on all of the great stuff that you have done, Buffalo, Niagara River Keeper. What was the real turning point? Uh, where stuff really started to happen, and that's what really impresses me about all of you. You make stuff happen, and it's good stuff. What was the real turning point in Buffalo, Niagara? Well, I think for the example for the Buffalo, which I think you're referencing, the Buffalo River um, restoration, the real turning point happened in 2003 when the Environmental Protection Agency, who um, had been witnessing areas of concern all over the Great Lakes, and a lot of a lot of things were stalled. We had only received, we kind of plateaued on some progress in the AOCs. They wanted to think a little bit differently about how they managed remedial action plans or how they oversaw it. Um, and so Riverkeeper had received a competitive grant to actually take over coordination of a remedial action plan, and that was the first time in the history of the Great Lakes um, that a nonprofit organization was given the mandate and the authority to oversee an actual remedial action plan. Um, that being said, we don't do anything in isolation. Everything was in partnership. We had great working relationships with the EPA, with the DEC, the Army Corps, um, and others. And I think that um, what really kept the ball rolling, uh, the other tipping point and turning point, is the citizen and the civic engagement. That community, our community, made it happen because a cleanup of that magnitude is so easy to dismiss because the problem is too big, but the community wouldn't let that happen. So at every point where it thought it was gonna fail, the community rallied, the community groups rallied, demanded of their leaders that this is what we want, it's worth the fight, it's worth the hard work. Um, and that citizen voice, and I can probably give you 50 other examples of the, of the citizen voices that really drove change um, all around this region. Mr. DeSantis? Well, I wasn't going to let anybody, you know, let's, they were going to just walk off the stage without any questions. So I was going to try to put one out there. But if, uh, if, I, do, if I can pose a question uh, to each of the panelists, uh, because I'm impressed with everything. I'm, I'm most familiar with the work of Riverkeeper, obviously. Uh, but, I, you know, I'm just Im really impressed with all three of you as uh, presenters today. What's next for each of you? Good question. The fun has just begun. <laughs> I think we've made a first step into addressing part of the problem is the development. So that's, that's been addressed. Our moving forward, first of all, this bylaw is going to come into effect in October. It has also been approved by the Ministry of the Environment, which we're quite pleased with because it will set uh, a precedent for the rest of the province, hopefully. But moving forward, we have to deal with those septic tanks. That is a major issue because that is what's causing the contamination of our lake and our drinking water. So we're going to be looking at how we're going to rehabilitate the lake. We're going to be looking at potential solutions because it's coming upstream and it's smaller municipalities that have limited resources financially. Uh, we're going to come up with a plan on how we're going to move towards hopefully connecting, eliminating those septic tanks that have now reached a critical age, and that's what's going into the groundwater and 
all that uh, fun stuff is flowing downstream. So we're going to be looking at um, how we can connect them to a sewer system. Um, we have a lot of work left to do. Uh, we're not giving up, but we're going to be turning to partners. We're going to be turning to, uh, obviously, different levels uh, of government to help us out financially to address this problem. Um, and we're going to continue to be very vigilant with development, and um, hopefully we'll, we'll get there. I think it's a step in the right direction. Um, and basically, uh, with the support of the population, I think it comes back to what you're saying. We know we have the support of the population. With that, we can get anything done and convince our colleagues that are still hesitant on getting on board uh, to move forward with us. Yeah, thank you very much. Great question. Uh, well, now, now that we have this project completely funded, it's, it's, uh, it's already in the ground, so that's, that's a great thing. Uh, the province of Ontario owns 200 of the 254 acres. They're going to be selling that this year. We have our official plan finished. We have uh, our uh, official plan policies are written. They're in draft form. They'll be, they'll be coming to council for approval in uh, September. We also have in our official plan policies uh, district energy, uh, vacuum waste systems, uh, stormwater canals, pretty much everything that we've learned in the last 15 years years, the province has agreed to tie the master plan and the official plan policies to, to the sale, so we're pretty confident about that. But the next thing that we're actually really going to be doing is we have a, an innovation corridor for seven to 9,000 jobs, and um, the anchor of that innovation corridor is an advanced research centre for Great Lakes Environmental and Urban Sustainability. Uh, we've re we're, we're going to be receiving a, a funding from the provincial government to do the business case on that. And we have currently have partnerships with uh, the region of Peel, the city of Mississauga, uh, because we have a water and wastewater plant and we have uh, doctoral students that have been working in the way of water and wastewater plants for the last four years. They're two of the most advanced plants in the world and we've upgraded them considerably in the last six years. Uh, so uh, we're working with uh, University of Waterloo, Guelph, uh, University of Toronto, Ryerson, and a couple of different other universities, plus the building industry and land development people, because they want to know we're going to be building some of the world's most environmentally sustainable communities uh, and buildings. They they they're really interested in you know how do we do better brownfield remediation, how do how do we insulate houses better, how do we make them smarter? So we want to create this uh, this center. So that's uh, that's sort of what my focus is, you know, politically and the work that I, and the advocacy work that I've been doing at the provincial and federal federal levels now for about the last probably about the last ten months. So we'll just keep working on that one. Thank you. Um, and as for us, I think uh, there's still a lot to be done in the region. We have a hundred years worth of legacy to still address, but we don't want to be caught up in the the mode of just um, undoing the previous generation's pa poor decisions and past mistakes. We have to be forward thinking. Um, because we're in this interesting place where there's still a lot to restore, but we have a lot of progress and economic development happening. We need to make sure we're not going to make those same mistakes again, because we're not cleaning that river again. Um, and it's, uh, you know, how do we get water, water values, and environmental um, considerations as a primary component of the economic development process. And ultimately, um, as a region throughout the Great Lakes, we are one of the few societies that actually willfully, knowingly permit ourselves to pollute our drinking water supplies. And that is something that over time, it's not just algae and nutrients and um, lead and pipes. It's the 100,000 other chemicals that are being used throughout the world, and only 1,400 of them are regulated. We have emerging contaminants that we don't even know um, uh, what it's doing to our drinking water. So I think drinking water for all organizations is a huge priority. Well, I want to thank the panel for some great presentations and uh, thank the audience for some great uh, questions here.